the, com the subcommittee on uh, courts and competition policy will now come to order. Without objection, the chair will be authorized to declare a recess of the hearing, and I'll now recognize myself for a short statement. First of all, good evening, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, this is a, a, a topic that uh, many of us want to learn about. Uh, the single most important issue on the minds of people today is the state of the global economy. The statistics are grim. We are in the midst of an economic downturn that, by some measures, uh, is the deepest since the Great Depression. 12.5 million Americans, uh, or 8.1 percent of our workforce, are unemployed. The net worth of U.S. households declined by nearly $11 trillion in 2008, erasing 18 percent of American wealth in a single year. Every week, local businesses and big national retailers alike announce losses, layoffs, or bankruptcy. The origins of our current economic downturn can be traced in part to the issuance of high-risk mortgage-backed securities in the earlier part of the decade. When the housing bubble collapsed in late 2007, anyone holding these mortgages or securities derived from these mortgages got caught in a downward spiral. In spring of 2008, the rapid devaluation of these mortgage-backed securities shook investor confidence and was partially responsible for the credit crisis that began gripping our economy. Bear Stearns was sold over a weekend to J.P. Morgan Chase, and the federal government put Fannie Mae and F Freddie Mac into receivership. Last September, hopes for a quick recovery were dashed when Merrill Lynch had to be sold to Bank of America. Lehman Brothers was uh, allowed to, uh, or I would say forced into bankruptcy, if you will, and uh, AIG, the, the now well-known uh, company, uh, asked the federal government for a $40 billion bridge loan, which has since escalated, I think, into about $180 billion or $170 billion, something like that. Since August of 2008, the federal government has invested hundreds of billions of dollars into financial institutions, either directly into these institutions, which, are, which were or are and have been uh, deemed uh, too big to fail, or through the uh, TARP program, the, traf the uh, Trouble Asset Recovery Program. Although the stated goal of the TARP funding was to increase liquidity in the credit markets and stimulate lending, some of the funds were used by recipient banks to acquire competing banks that in some cases were, had been denied uh, TARP funding. It's not my intention, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to suggest that either the previous or uh, the current administrations should have sat out idly by as the economy plummeted. I believe that my colleagues on both sides of the aisle can agree that the intention of both administrations was to protect a fragile economy from further destabilization. Our purpose here as the Courts and Competition Policy Subcommittee is to determine whether or not this economic downturn was uh, <clears throat> worsened by uh, antitrust. In particular, there are two interrelated issues I'd like for us to consider. One, uh, this concept of too big to fail. Uh, are there such things as institutions that are too big to fail, and if so, should antitrust have prevented them from becoming so embedded in the economy? The second is the use of TARP money and bank consolidation. When the federal government provides funds uh, to the acquiring bank but denies it to the acquired bank, is antitrust law adequately suited to evaluate the competitive effects of these acquisitions when the government, by the stroke of a pen, can radically shift market power? 
And by doing so, are we simply creating the next generation of institutions that are too big to fail? At the end of today, I hope that uh, our panel will have provided us with guidance as to uh, what we can do and what we should do to prevent this type of um, crisis uh, from reoccurring. I now recognize my uh, honorable colleague, um, Mr. Co Mr. Uh, Howard Coble, the ranking member of this uh, subcommittee for his um, opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good to welcome the panel with us this, this afternoon. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing of the Courts and Competitive Competition Policy Subcommittee. Without a doubt, and you, you've touched on it to some extent, the current economic crisis has altered the way that we view government intervention with business. Many, including me, were wary of giving large sums of money to financial institutions in the wake of the failure of Lehman Brothers uh, last September. I reluctantly voted for the initial disbursement of emergency economic stabilization funds because of the outcry from many of my constituents who viewed it as their only means to protect their life savings. I continue, Mr. Chairman, to be very skeptical of the approach we've taken to stabilize and stimulate our economy. The current AIG bonus controversy is a prime example. That said, today's hearing gives us the opportunity to examine how past government intervention, specifically antitrust enforcement, may have contributed to the current situation. First, this hearing will examine whether mergers created some of the institutions that were too big to fail. It will also examine whether antitrust law, as it has been traditionally understood, could or should have prevented some of these institutions from getting to the point that the government felt compelled to bail them out. Secondly, the course of providing relief funds under the government's TARP program, it appears that the government has, in at least one instance, deliberately supplied money to one bank for the purpose of acquiring another. In other cases, banks have used the TARP funds to assist in the purchase of other banking institutions. This hearing gives us the opportunity to explore whether the existing antitrust review properly protects taxpayers from ultimately having to save other institutions that are, again, too big to fail. As a North Carolinian, Mr. Chairman, I'm proud that my state is home to two very large financial institutions. One of those, Bank of America, has re uh, received TARP funds and has acquired troubled financial institutions, including Merrill Lynch and Countrywide Financial. The other, Wachovia, was not so fortunate. It was recently acquired by Wells Fargo, as you know. Whether they were being acquired or doing the acquiring, these transactions have had and will continue to have a significant impact on the residents in my state and upon other states. Not unlike all members, I have a number of small banks and credit unions in my district. Mr. Chairman, as no doubt you do. It is my hope that these essential institutions are not forgotten in this debate or by policymakers here in, in D.C. Finally, I'd like to note that we're facing a bipartisan problem here. The regal Neal Interstate Banking and Branching Efficiency Act of 1994 which enabled banks to operate across state lines was passed with strong bipartisan support under a Democratic president and by a democratically controlled Congress. The Graham-Leach-Blally Act, which allowed banks to expand into broader areas of business, including insurance and secretaries, also enjoyed broad bipartisan support and was passed by a Republican-controlled Congress. Similarly, President Clinton's antitrust division provided, presided over the merger of Citicorp with the Travelers Group in 1998, which created Citigroup, while President Bush's antitrust division presided over the Wells Fargo uh, symbol for Dash Wachovia deal, among others. Undoubtedly, the Ad Obama administration will face similar mergers as the financial crisis continues and deepens. All of this, Mr. Chairman, is to say that this is neither a Democratic 
nor a Republican problem. It is an American problem. And I appreciate your willingness, Mr. Chairman, to invite to have invited a, a balanced panel, a panel to discuss these issues. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time and look forward to hearing from our witnesses. I thank the gentleman. <coughs> Excuse me. I thank the gentleman for his uh, statement. And without objection, uh, any uh, additions uh, that you want to make to it uh, will be uh, included in the record as well. Uh, do any of my other colleagues on this uh, subcommittee wish to make opening statements? Mr. Chairman, I, I'll just, I, I won't take the full five minutes. I do think it's interesting that um, uh, as a result of serving on both the Financial Services Committee and the Judiciary Committee um, on the same day um, in two separate committees of jurisdiction, we are dealing in one respect or another with the uh, question of too big to fail. Uh, I didn't want to be here to hear the testimony because uh, 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 I'm not sure that um, um, whether an institution is acquired or is acquiring um, another financial institution and that in and of itself makes it too big to fail is something that uh, ought to be an independent criteria um, for evaluation by the Justice Department uh, under the antitrust law. Um, so um, uh, while I think this is an interesting inquiry um, and a certainly a topical inquiry. Uh, I hope we don't uh, go too far overboard in that direction because um, uh, I think that might be an overreaction to um, uh, to what's going on in the current economic uh, context. Uh, um, that said, uh, I'll be uh, very anxious to uh, to hear the testimony and it's certainly a matter that uh, um, when it involves antitrust implications um, um, is a matter of the jurisdiction of this, uh, of this committee and this subcommittee. Um, um, and um, I'll be uh, interested in knowing how these witnesses uh, um, tie this all together. So. With that, I'll yield back. Uh, I appreciate the gentleman having the hearing. Uh, I guess the more I can talk about too big to fail, whether in the context of antitrust laws or in the context of how you create a systemic regulator uh, to, uh, to um, supervise it, uh, the better off I am because the more I understand about the issue, uh, the better we're able to legislate on it. And I appreciate it and yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Congressman White out of California, one of our resident uh, legal scholars on this, uh, on this committee and especially on this subcommittee. I uh, want to welcome also. Uh, I thought you were introducing Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm from North Carolina, I'm gonna, not California. I'm, he's another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I also want to recognize uh, my colleague from Utah, Mr. Uh, Jason Shavitz. And uh, he is a uh, brand new member. We welcome you to the SEP committee. And uh, if, uh, if there are any other opening statements, uh, uh, I see that. Uh, my colleague, uh, the cerebral Mr. Uh, Brad Sherman out of California uh, cannot uh, help himself. He, he must uh, share his knowledge with us and we definitely appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, too big to fail. Those words are an affront to capitalism. Capitalism can only work when entities are allowed to fail. But too big to fail is not only an attack on the taxpayers saying, you must bail us out. We have created this house of cards. We did it for our own benefit. 
and you must insure us against risk, but it is also an attack on competition. Because if an entity claims to be too big to fail, what they're really saying is, don't just look at our balance sheet to see whether we're credit worthy. Look at the balance sheet of the United States federal government. That is available to you. And so these entities are able to uh, borrow at uh, reduced uh, interest rates, giving the too big to fail a chance to get bigger at the expense of those who are small enough to fail. Um, you know, we face this in, in my own community. When you have a financial institution that becomes insolvent, the FDIC takes them over, the insured depositors have paid for that insurance uh, because they get a little lower yield and the bank has to pay into the FDIC fund and you paid for the insurance and to the extent you're insured, the federal government's there to pay on the insurance that you've paid for to the federal government. But everybody else, the bondholders of that local bank, the accounts that are in excess of FDIC insurance, they don't get any taxpayer money. Why? Well, that bank wasn't too big to fail. That's why we have receivership. In contrast, you have uh, a dozen or so of the largest financial institutions in the country whose general creditors uh, are being paid with taxpayer money. And the fact that they're being paid is, uh, if anything, proof that if you have to lend money, lend it to somebody who's too big to fail. Give them the good interest rate. Give them the chance uh, to succeed. Uh, and so what we ought to have done, what we can still do, is to put into receivership those financial institutions that are insolvent and deal with them the same way we deal with everyone else. Now, this will turn them into much stronger financial institutions. Because the way you clean up a balance sheet is not by taking off assets, even, quote, toxic assets. The way you clean up a balance sheet is you take off liabilities. And that's what happens in receivership. You give a haircut to the general creditors. These companies are not too big to fail. It is said that they're too interconnected to fail. I don't think that's true either. They're too well connected to fail. And so the general creditors are coming here, and so far they've been successful in getting a federal bailout. What we see here is a casino, a casino created at AIG's Financial Products Division, where a lot of people were smart but not smart enough. They placed the winning bets. They went to the AIG casino, and they bet against the mortgages being valuable. And they were right on their bet. But there were so many of them that they broke the bank. And now these gamblers are here in Washington having us bail out the bank that they've broken. That is not the right role for the federal government, and it is not a, the right competition model for the future, where smaller banks and larger banks should all live by the same rules. And that is, you either if you pay for federal insurance, you get it up to the terms of that insurance, and otherwise, the general creditor is a general creditor and when you're a general creditor of an insolvent financial institution, uh, you take a huge haircut. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the time. I, I will say that it was unexpected to hear you mention the term haircut uh, twice. <laughs> I'm now pleased, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm glad you have such a, a great uh, sense of humor. Uh, Congressman, um, we, we're all laughing with you, not at you. Um, and I don't want to put myself in line to, uh, to, for replies either. Um, but uh, I'm pleased now to introduce uh, the witnesses for today's hearing. The first is Mr. Burt Four president of the American Antitrust Institute. Mr. Four is a recognized antitrust expert who served previously as assistant director and acting deputy director of the Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Competition. Welcome, Mr. Four. 
next is uh, Mr. C. R. Rusty Cloutier. Cloutier. I've been struggling with that for, for a while, Mr. Cloutier. And uh, Mr. Cloutier is president of the Mid-South Bank. Um, he's also past chairman of the Independent uh, Community Bankers of America. And uh, in 2004, he was uh, honored by the city of Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, he was given the highest award, the Civic Cup, for uh, his, uh, his civic uh, uh, actions. And we appreciate you being here also, sir. Uh, next is Mr. William Askew, Senior Policy Advisor for the Financial Services Roundtable. Uh, in addition to his role with the Roundtable, uh, Mr. Askew is a Senior Executive Vice President of Regions Financial Corporation. Regions uh, Financial Corporation made Forbes' uh, Platinum 400 list uh, of America's best big companies. As head of the retail banking for Regions from 1987 to 2006, Mr. Askew played a leadership role in the acquisition of the consortium of banks that created regions. Welcome, Mr. Askew. Also on the panel is uh, Ms. Deborah Garza, former Assistant Attorney General for the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division. Prior to her most recent tenure at the department, uh, Ms. Garza chaired the Antitrust Modernization Commission, which is a bipartisan panel created by Congress to evaluate the U.S. antitrust laws and policy uh, <coughs> recommendations, and also to make policy recommendations to the Congress and to the President. And I'd like to add that uh, the members of the Commission, as well as its recommendations, are held in highest regard by this subcommittee. And we thank you and your colleagues uh, for all the work that you have put in uh, and, and for the benefit uh, of uh, the, the citizens as well as uh, uh, the uh, commercial interests that are, are so important uh, to the, in this, uh, for this country. And uh, last but not least, I'd like to recognize uh, Dr. Mark Cooper, who's also on our panel panel. He's the Director of Research at the Consumer Federation of America, and uh, he has provided expert testimony in over 250 cases for public interest clients, ranging from attorneys general uh, to citizen interveners before state and federal agencies, courts, and legislatures in the United States as well as Canada. And uh, I want to welcome you all to, uh, to this uh, important um, uh, hearing, and uh, just one housekeeping matter, matter. Um, any uh, opening statements um, that have not been presented orally uh, were, uh, may be submitted in writing, and um, uh, there will be uh, five business days within which that can happen. Um, And the same goes for uh, the panelists also. Um, your written statement will be placed into the record, and we wish to ask you that you uh, limit your oral presentation to five minutes. Uh, you'll note that uh, we have a lighting system which is right in front of you. Uh, it starts with a green light, uh, and then uh, at four minutes it uh, displays a yellow light and then thereafter, uh, we all know what red means. Um, after each witness has presented his or her testimony, subcommittee members uh, will be permitted to ask questions subject to the five-minute rule. Mr. Four, will uh, please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. And if the committee wishes to discuss haircuts further, uh, happy to take you on. Uh, I'm going to pose five questions and try to answer them very briefly, perhaps cryptically. My written statement contains elaboration. First, what do we mean by too big to fail? It's important at the outset to observe that the chief issues are not large size alone 
or even inadequate competition the too big to fail problems relate to one creation of large organizations that are so deeply embedded in the economy that their failure is likely to have ripple effects which cumulatively are just not acceptable to the polity combined with two failure of governmental oversight to require relevant disclosure of escalating risks that is the information that would be necessary if government were to determine to inhibit the formation of such organizations or to protect against their failure question two was antitrust policy responsible for allowing the too big to fail problem well it's the more broadly conceived competition policy that i think has failed the more narrowly defined antitrust enterprise that is the sherman clayton and ftc x was not empowered to stop mergers on the basis of either the absolute size of the resulting institution or a calculation of the systemic consequences of their eventual failure. We lack a workable antitrust mechanism for stopping large conglomerate mergers that create giant corporations without at the same time reducing competition in specific markets. My third question. Can current antitrust law protect us from future mergers that will create a too big to fail problem? And my answer cryptically is no, not most of the time. My fourth question, can current antitrust law be used to break up financial service uh, services or other organizations that are deemed too big to fail? And my cryptic answer again is no. So let me turn to the final question, what should Congress do? And I have four suggestions. First, Congress should create within the Department of Justice Antitrust Division and should appropriately budget a new position, Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Emergency Restructuring. The purpose is to give competition policy an important place at the table as regulatory and legislative policies are developed to deal with the recession. I think this should be a high priority as decisions are being made now that may have long-term competitive effects. And Congress should assure that a loud competition voice is heard in a timely and respectful way in the councils that are restructuring our economy. Second, Congress should emphasize that competition policy concerns be taken into account during a recession and even during emergency consolidation situations. History suggests that industries faced with downsizing seek ways to do so jointly. The three C's of consumer catastrophe are consolidation, cartelization, and constraints on trade. These strategies have not worked in the past, and we need to remain especially vigilant against them now. My third proposal, Congress should consider creating legislation that will give the government an opportunity to stop the formation of new organizations that are too big to fail. In my statement, I develop a procedure for facilitating governmental review of mergers that potentially create or exacerbate an unreasonable systemic risk. And when such mergers are identified, they could not be consummated for a period of time during which a task force of relevant regulators, including antitrust officials, could report on both the beneficial effects and the risks of the merger. The president would be empowered to make a final decision to stop the merger. The process could be truncated during an emergency. The predictions required by this process will be quite difficult, but we should err on the side of not generating new risks of substantial catastrophe, even if the probability of occurrence is low. I see I'm about out of time. Let me make one final point, please. For the longer term, Congress should create a process for rethinking where we are. 
and where we want to be after the current crisis has settled down and in my paper i propose what i call t neck to a new version of the temporary national economic committee that served during the new deal i won't have time to go into that right now but i would be pleased to answer your questions thank you sir um, and before we proceed uh, to mr cloutier I'd like to welcome um, and recognize the presence of our uh, esteemed chairman of the full committee, uh, the Honorable uh, John Conyers from Michigan. And I would also ask you, sir, um, uh, whether or not you wanted to make an opening statement. Okay. So uh, thank you, sir. And uh, we shall proceed uh, with the panel. Uh, Mr. Cloutier. Chairman Johnson, Representative Kobo, and members of the committee, my name is Rusty Cluche. I'm the president and CEO of Mid-South Bank Corp, a $936 million bank holding company located in Lafayette, Louisiana. We operate in all of South Louisiana and most of Southeast Texas. We are community oriented and focused primarily on offering commercial and consumer loan and deposit services to individuals and small businesses, middle market businesses, et cetera. I am pleased to represent the Community Bankers of America and ICBA's 5,000 members at this important hearing. While recent government funding has encouraged consolidation in banking, this is nothing new. For decades, antitrust laws, banking laws, and banking regulations have all contributed to consolidation of the banking and financial industry. I personally have spent years warning policymakers of the systemic risk that were being created in our nation by unbridled growth in the nation's largest banks and financial firms. But I was told I just didn't get it. I didn't understand the new global economy, that I was a protectionist, and that I was afraid of competition, that I needed to get with the modern times. Sadly, we know what modern times look like, and it hasn't been pretty. Excessive concentration has led to systemic risk and the credit crisis we now face. Banking and antitrust laws were much too narrow to prevent these risks. Antitrust laws are supposed to maintain competitive geographic and product markets. If there were enough competitors in a particular market, that ends the re requirement. This often prevented local banks from merging, but it does nothing to prevent the creation of the giant nationwide franchises. Banking regulation is simple, is similar. The agencies acts only if a given merger will enhance the safety and soundness of the individual firms. They generally answer bigness, bigger is always necessarily to make a stronger financial institution. It can, many say, spread the risk across geographic areas and business lines. No one wonders what would have happened if it and its counterparts jumped off a cliff and made billion in unsound mortgages. We now know the economy is in a crisis. The four largest banking companies, many of which uh, have been bailed out by the United States government, now control over 40 percent of the nation's deposits and more than 50 percent of the U.S. bank assets. This is not in the public interest. A more diverse financial system would reduce risk and promote competition, innovation, and the availability of credit to the consumers of various means and business sizes. We can prove this. Despite the challenges we face, the community bank segment of the financial system is still working and working well. We, the community banks, are open for business. We are making loans, and we are ready to help all Americans weather these difficult times without government assistance. But I must report that community banks are angry. Almost every Monday morning, they wake up to the news that the government has bailed out yet another too-big-to-fail institution while on Saturdays they hear that the FDIC has summarily closed one or two too small to fail institutions. And just recently, the FDIC proposed a huge special premium to pay for the losses imposed by large institutions. This inequity must end, and only Congress can do it. The current situation will damage community banks and the consumers and the small businesses that we serve. What can we do? ICBA recommends the following measures. Congress should direct a fully staffed interagency task force to immediately identify systemic risk institutions. They should be put immediately under federal supervision. 
the federal systemic risk agency should impose two fees on these institutions that one would compensate the agencies for the cost of their soup their supervision and capitalize a systemic risk fund comparable to the f d i c so the united states taxpayers do not have to pick up their losses in the future the f d i c should impose a systemic risk premium on any insured bank that is affiliated with a systemic risk firm the systemic risk regulator should impose higher capital charges to provide a cushion against systemic risk the congress should direct the systemic risk regulator in the f d i c to develop procedures to resolve the failure of a systemic risk institution. The Congress should direct the agency systemic risk task force to order the breakup of systemic risk institutions that cause problems for America. Congress should direct the systemic risk regulator to block any merger that will result in, a, in the creation of systemic risk institution in the future. And finally, it should direct the systemic risk regulator to block any financial activity that threatens to impose systemic risk. The current crisis provides you an opportunity to strengthen our nation's financial system and the economy by taking these important steps. They will protect the taxpayers, create a vibrant banking system where small and large institutions are able to fairly compete. The ICBA urges Congress to quickly seize this opportunity, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cloutier. Uh, we'll, uh, we, we're in the middle of uh, voting uh, on the floor, uh, but we have time for at least one more st uh, opening statement. And so, uh, Mr. Uh, Askew, would you proceed? Yes, sir. Chairman Conyers, Chairman Johnson, and Ranking Member Coble, it's on. and members of the committee. I'm Bill Askew, Senior Advisor to the Financial Services Roundtable. At this hearing, I am representing the Roundtable, but I actually wear two hats as I'm also a banker. During the last 25 years, I worked within the antitrust laws as we acquired and merged a number of banks. I know the antitrust division of the Department of Justice, the Federal Reserve, and the antitrust mechanisms are working well because I've experienced them firsthand. The vestures have been one of the most challenging and difficult parts of my job over the last two decades. It is not just deposits you give up in a divestiture, it is customers, associates, brick and mortar, and hard fault market share, all built over many years. But as difficult as this was, the point is the system works and antitrust laws do the job as they are intended to do. As part of this process, the laws are straightforward. Banks know when they agree to merge that certain market share concentrations will probably require divestitures. The Justice Department selects the specific branches based upon independent review. This is the function of antitrust law, to review pending acquisitions and prevent mergers that would substantially lessen competition or restrain trade in any section of the country. Given the number of participants in the market today, we assess the financial services sector as highly competitive. As of 2007, the financial industry included 5,000 registered broker-dealers, 1,250 thrifts, 8,000 credit unions, 7,250 commercial banks, 1,200 life insurance companies, and 2,700 property and casualty companies. We believe that the current crisis is not a result of failure of antitrust laws. Rather, it is a combination of several unprecedented and interrelated financial events. Large amounts of savings investments flowing into the United States financial system searching for a higher return. A booming housing market with home prices increasing at record levels served by an under-regulated mortgage lending engine. Innovation in largely unregulated credit derivatives, collateralized debt obligations, and credit default swaps. And excessive leverage in firms who failed to put the brakes on their own borrowing in the midst of cheap money supply. A fragmented system of national and state financial regulations straddled these market conditions, and in the end, no federal agency was responsible for examining the totality of the risk created in interconnected firms and markets. Decades of ad hoc legislation and regulatory updates, not our antitrust laws, has created significant gaps in financial regulation that permitted some financial services firms to operate with minimal oversight. 
to address these shortcomings, the Roundtable has developed a proposed financial regulatory ar architecture as illustrated in my written testimony. It has six key features. First, we propose an expansion of the President's Working Group with the Financial Market Coordinating Council. Second, to address systemic risk, we propose the Federal Reserve be authorized to act as a market stability regulator. Third, to eliminate gaps in regulation, we propose the consolidation of several existing federal agencies into single national financial institutions regulator. Fourth, to focus greater attention on the stability of the financial markets, the creation of a national capital markets agency. Fifth, we propose the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation be reconstituted as an insurer for bank deposits, retail insurance policies written by nationally chartered insurance companies and for investors who have claims against broker dealers. Finally, as the market stability regulator interacts with regulators, there is an evident need to create a national insurance regulator. Mr. Chairman, as a result of this crisis, some financial firms have been labeled too big to fail. Their counterparty obligations in global REITs required that they be treated by the Fed and Treasury differently than typical institutions. It does not, however, make them examples of market power in, a trust, in the trust sense of the antitrust law, in the truest sense of the antitrust law, excuse me. The trouble in financial services sector has exposed severe flaws regulatory and otherwise, which I have detailed, but a lack of competition and choice for consumers is not one of them. We commend you and the other members of Congress for your work to modernize and strengthen financial regulation. This work is of the highest priority and I will, I am confident produce, and it will, I am confident produce a regulatory regime that will help us and every American consumer and the companies with whom they choose to do business emerge from this crisis stronger than before. Thank you. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Askew. And at this time, uh, it would be uh, best for us to go into a recess. We'll be back in about uh, maybe 20, 25 minutes. We appreciate you all's patience. Thank you. <laughs>